Credit score tactics. What I've gone ahead and done is created an entire masterclass, cherry picking all the best videos, all the best moments from in those videos from our channel, which we've now published over 350 videos over the last couple of years. And we've put out that all together to give you the best tools that you need to go and tackle uh, your credit score. So this is how to improve it. This is how to get the most out of, you know, your credit score, out of getting credit funding. All of that is what you can expect in this video series. So we're gonna tackle the app spree day. We're gonna tackle pre-qualifications and over 80 that we've got for you in one of our resources, as well as what is the end goal? What are we trying to do with personal credit, business credit, credit, sole proprietor credit, all of that and how it fits together cohesively into our plan and into our strategy. So I hope you guys enjoy this. We put a lot of time into this video. Uh, be sure to comment below and of course, share this with a friend. View more videos on the channel because it'll help us grow. Thank you so much. Let's dive into it. In this video, we're gonna cover uh, how to boost your credit score in 30 days. All right, so first off, we have to reference the infamous FICO pie chart. Is There's two things that I wanna point out here, okay? There's amount owed, which is 30% of your FICO score. And then there's payment history, which is 35% of your FICO score. So together, those two things are what? 65% of your FICO score. The first thing we need to do is uh, lower utilization. Now this can be done many different ways. And again, it can be done through the lens of temporary or you know long-term fix. Simplest thing to do is just pay more money. <laughs> so pay more down on the debt before the statement date. This is where you can actually start to play the game because there's two dates that you need to know. There's the payment date or the payment due date and then the statement date. Those dates are usually not the same. The statement date is when it generates new statement, which then calculates how much interest you owe on the credit card, the installment loan, et cetera, right? And then the payment date is just when you gotta make the payment. So if you wanna game this and get ahead, whether it's for a short-term window to make your credit profile look a little bit better or long-term, you wanna make sure that you're paying more down before the statement date, you guessed it. Okay, next is, speaking of utilization, remember this is, if we are over 50% utilization, expect your uh, credit score to drop by 50 points, a minimum. And if you're over 70% uh, utilization, your score is gonna drop by at least 100 points. I've seen it and I've done it, so I can speak directly from experience. All right, next, number two, we wanna catch up late payments. So we already dealt with 30% of the credit profile. Now let's deal with the 35%. Payment history, well, AKA late payments. Late payments are insane actually, because uh, first off, uh, they can drop your score 50 to 100 points. Next is they can stay on your credit profile for five to seven years. So it's like the same as a bankruptcy. You might as well just go bankrupt instead of missing a late payment. So it's like, it's that valuable uh, to your credit score to just please do not let that happen. And so there's a few things we can do here. If it's the first time you've done it and you literally just did it like this month, last month, call them. Call the creditor itself. This is the first time this happened. Blame COVID, blame, blame your grandma, blame anybody. Make it convincing, create a good story, and just, you know, essentially beg for forgiveness. If they say no, hang up, call back, call back, call back, call back till you get a good rep who's having a nice day, who's happy, who wants to help people, they're excited about life still. You want that type of person because you know they're gonna be the one that's like, hey, okay, let's let's get rid of this. And if it's older than that, then you're gonna have to go to work. You know, whatever angle we're trying to play, it's like, it's an open account. You've been paying it. it like it's, it's really hard to win that. So your best bet is a goodwill letter. And um, if it's got a legal letterhead, if it's like written by a lawyer with legal, you know, legal verbiage used and that kind of, you know, lawyer tone, you're going to have a better success rate than if you write it yourself. But if you did want to write it yourself, just make sure that you get some sort of legal head and it, it'll do much better than, you know, again, without it. What else I've noticed that's interesting is if a late payment is like four years or older, just forget about it. Don't really try and do anything with it because it doesn't really seem to impact your score that much. And these are due to changes with, you know, FICO 8 to FICO 9 and now with FICO 10, these kind of like short-term issues that you have, they go away fairly quick, right? So that's what I would suggest there. Uh, again, late payments is probably the most difficult one that you gotta face. So lastly, if you're having issues with, you know, making your payments or you're forgetting, you're constantly like waking up in the middle of the night, stressed out, thinking, did I pay that one? Make yourself some simple alerts. You can do this in Google Calendar. You can do this with some sort of other software. You can spend all kinds of money, I'm sure, creating software or you know using some other paid software to do this. But we could just use Google Calendar and just you know put in those payment dates or put it in a few days before the payment date because trying to make the payment on the payment date is a bad idea. Or another way you could do this is to set up auto billing. First off, I'd rather have my account overdraft any day of the week than be late on a credit card because I can go and fix that. And a lot of these banks are still giving you leniency on overdraft fees, uh, especially on business accounts, because they know that times are still tough. 
So I can go get leniency on that a whole lot easier than I can go get leniency on a late payment. So overdraft my account all you want, as long as I get that, that credit card payment made on time. That's the way I look at it. And then the second thing you could do is just do the minimum payment. Like you don't have to make some big audacious payment with the auto pay, just do the minimum. So then, okay, that's done and dusted, that's covered. It's gonna get paid in time with plenty of time for it to clear and no issues are gonna happen there or goofiness on the payment itself. And that would be a way that you can ensure that you don't have this issue. All right, number three, remove collection accounts. So if you've got collection accounts sitting on your credit profile right now, we need to get to work on those. Here's the tricky thing is out of the gates, if you're gonna do letters, expect at least four rounds of letters. And if you're gonna do this yourself, you could hire somebody, a credit repair, et cetera, but there probably are some good ones out there. But if you wanted to handle this yourself, expect, you know, four rounds plus of letters. Now, the next thing that's kind of weird with all this is, okay, so we're calling this, this debt company or this company that holds the debt. We're trying to get to a point of them not playing games, messing around with us without really admitting who we are. Because there's something tricky and, and shady that a debtor can do when they're talking to you. If they can get you to confirm your name, confirm your information, they could, not saying they will, they could report an update to the credit bureaus on that debt, which in some states restarts the debt cycle. So what do I mean by that? Is after a certain amount of years, we can use the fact that it's a dormant debt essentially as the means to remove it. By locking down second tier bureaus and the type of lettering that we use, we can actually like point the two at each other and say, hey, he's the bad guy, they can't double check it. And then so, oh, yep, must be right because we can't double check that data. And then that's how it gets removed. And so the longer it sits dormant, the better for removing it, the easier it is to remove. That being said is like the minute we call them up or try to talk to them to, to work out some sort of pay to delete or pay to you know get rid of this and some sort of way is they could if they wanted to we don't follow through you know fast enough or whatever they could update the debt and that would kind of restart that that clock i'm pretty sure that still exists if not uh correct me in the comments section keep in mind that it'll still show up like the lates and everything all the history leading up to the collection but at least now it'll show a settled account that's not ideal like it would it would actually be better if it was just removed completely so that's why a lot of people opt to not pay it and then they just try and remove it again that's up to you I'm not a credit repair guy. Number four, wake up old cards. So we've shared this story several times now, but uh, George Washington lost $77,000 with FNBO because they were uh, cards that he didn't use. They were sock drawer cards. He wasn't even putting minimum spend on them. And because of that, they shut down the accounts. We do not want to be losing trade lines or having trade lines cut because we aren't using them. So we have to come up with some sort of process to rotate through a minimum spend, five, $10 um, on these cards so that they stay active. The longer you leave those cards inactive and don't use them, the higher your risk or the higher the chance of them either cutting the limit or closing the account. And we don't want that. So we have to use these cards. Again, like we've already got enough that we're trying to fix. The last thing we want is some like curveball out of left field that's slashing a credit line um, that we didn't see coming, right? That'd be horrible. And that can affect your credit score because again, if we're at this like super sensitive place to where our utilization is high and our, our credit score has been affected by that is if we were to have a credit limit now slashed, we could start to see a series of adverse reactions like a avalanche or you know a, a snowball effect of getting more and more and more and more. And then we're just like all the way down or pinned against the wall now because of that. And that can drop our score because now our utilization looks even higher, which would then trigger that. Number five, get new credit cards. So this is gonna be way trickier when you've got uh, high utilization and the score is below 680, because 685 is really like that minimum, but there are some options that we've got. So let's go over that. First, we wanna focus on fintechs that will not pull your credit score at all. Uh, maybe they're hooked up with uh, Plaid or uh, IMAX or some sort of link up your, your checking account to get approval type of card. Like we just covered the, uh, the Rocket card recently. That's another Deserve card. The CrowdFit card, any of the Deserve cards do that. You basically just upload your ID, take a selfie photo, and then um, link up your bank account. And then, you know, they'll approve you based off of that. So anything like that, we wanna stick with that. And then anything that will be a soft pull and tell us the limit that they're gonna give us before hard pull, or there's just no hard pull at all. So those are the only offers that you really wanna look at. And there's quite a bit there. There's Gemini, there is uh, the Apple card. There's also the GM card by Goldman. And who else we got? We got all the deserved cards. Yeah, there's probably some others. Go check out our, um, our soft pull credit page. And we've got like 80 something uh, offers on there. So you'll find plenty on there. So those are the types of cards that we wanna stick with because why do we even need new credit? Like, why, why should we be doing that? The limits are gonna be lower, yes, but we need fresh credit so that overall it 
it lowers our utilization. That's it. That's all we're trying to do. So by us getting more credit, it makes the utilization gap better. Make sense? Okay, number six, become an AU. AU meaning authorized user. Now, it's been a while since I did this. It hasn't been since like 2019. And I know that things have changed. Some of the credit cards who are reporting full history have changed. How long it takes them to report has changed with some banks, I'm sure. Are they still all reporting to all three bureaus? I'm sure we've seen some changes there, but AUs are still really, really powerful. Now, this can be used in two different ways. We can use this if we wanna go get credit at a new bank, we'll go get an AU at that bank. So then we, we're starting to share data points. But as I've shared in previous videos, you could go get a safety deposit box. You could go get added onto somebody else's account or a lot of other ways to get into that bank. So then they can start to send you targeted offers. If we didn't wanna do that route and or we wanted to thin out our utilization, get added on some AUs. So that is a shorter term fix unless you know the person because AUs are not cheap. So they're only gonna stay on your profile for like, I don't know, 60 to 90 days. I've seen some last longer, take a while for it to get kicked off, but expect that it's somewhere between 30 to 90 days for all of them. All this falls into a very quick, uh, actionable 30 day window that we could, we could actually do this, right? Number seven, keep payments on time. This should be an obvious one, but like, especially during, you know, this 30 day blitz or during the rebuilding process, you do not want to miss a payment. And I've already harped on that enough and stressed on that enough. We do not want to be missing payments on this. So again, keep up on that. Set yourself alerts, reminders, one day before, set up auto bill. I've given you the solutions, run with it. Okay, and number eight, lastly, diversify. Now I'm not just talking credit mix, meaning credit cards, installment loans, mortgages, car payments, all that. I'm not just talking that. I'm actually talking something different. I'm talking within the amount of credit cards that you've got, we need to diversify. Again, regardless if you're using the card or not, keeping a balance or paying it all off, they came in slash limits. George Washington lost $77,000. So I know that sometimes people question like, why would you want so much credit? That is one of the reasons why, is because we never know a Silvergate, a Silicon Valley bank situation happens, or they just do like FNBO, like Synchrony, you know, Community does this as well. You know, all these store credit cards do that to where they just cut and close accounts for no reason. Any bank actually can do that at any given time. So let's not forget that, right? Let's remember that. That's why we want to diversify. So we want to have our hand in enough pies to where, again, if they were to shut this down, it doesn't affect me and destroy my life. Okay, let's say that that 77,000 was 50% or 60% of your total credit, and they shut that down overnight. Your score tanks 100 to 150 points. Adverse actions start flying in. Everyone's cutting your limits, closing accounts. Your whole life is ruined. Your whole life is ruined over one decision that one person made or an AI made that had nothing to do with you. Crazy, right? So like, this isn't a game with what we're doing. I need to make that crystal clear. And that's why we want to diversify. But let's define what a thin credit profile actually is. Now, Experian has probably by far the clearest explanation for what a thin credit profile is. Five accounts or less or fewer reporting is considered a thin profile. Now, some people want to debate this, four, two, whatever. All it really is in short is that we don't have a lot of history, don't have a lot of accounts, and we don't have diversity of accounts, meaning that we don't have installment loans and mortgages and auto loans and revolving credit cards and all this stuff reporting for a really long time. Just essentially means that you have too few accounts to create a full picture of credit worthiness for potential lenders. It also might mean that you have none. So you have no credit score because you have no trade lines, no nothing being reported to your credit profile, okay? so. Those are what we're considering a thin credit profile. Again, we're assuming that you don't have derogatory accounts or late payments or anything like that going on. What's our options to fatten up our profile? Well, I got seven for you. First one, authorized users. We just touched on this briefly. Family, friends that have, you know, set up long established credit histories for who knows, three years, 10 years, 20 years. And as long as the payment history is great on those and the utilization is below 10%, add it on. Now, if you don't have family that you can do that with, let's say your whole family of immigrants who've come over here and none of you got credit, well, then you're gonna have to look at buying access to somebody else's AUs. This is kind of some somewhat slimy business still, only because first off out of the gates is even if you're added onto these accounts, a lot of them will only stay on your credit profile for 90 days or less. Some of them, they'll stay on for a really long time. Like I've had a few city accounts that still for some reason still uh, show up like a year later on some older Vantage scores and things like that. So again, your mileage will vary. I don't know. 
what it'll be for you, but understand that like 90 days would be a good amount of time to expect AU to show up for. So you've got to like kind of get this done in a small window of time. You've got to like make your whole plan, pull the trigger, fire off and get those AUs added. They get added. Then you go and try and get your new credit or whatever you're trying to do with this, right? AUs are still extremely powerful. No matter how much they try and downplay these with FICO 10 and all these different models that they're rolling out, AUs are still here, okay? So they're still really, really powerful. Next, credit builders. So we're going to break this up into two different categories. So these are two points here. We've got regular credit builders and subscription credit builders. First off, credit builders, these are usually a no hard pull credit product that's offered by a bank or institution. And the sole intention is to build credit. That's it. Okay. So they're usually more lenient. They're usually more flexible and you pay in every single month and it reports towards this overall trade line, right? And the trade line is what's reported every single month, online payments, all that works the same. Usually these are also reported as a installment loan. self Inc. comes to mind, Credit Strong. Look, we've got some here, Kovo, Kickoff, Meet Ava. Uh, that's slightly different. And then uh, Lockbox. Okay, so that's those options there. And then the other option would be uh, subscription. Here we go right here. And so subscription credit builders, just to split this out on its own, are simply the same kind of idea or concept, but the monthly subscription payment that you're already making to Netflix or whatever, HBO, Hulu, whatever you're paying for now, you do it through this service and they report that as an active trade line. Now, some of these are really small. Some of them are much better, like Grow Credit, for example. We did a dedicated video on that and people saw upwards of a 50 point uh, credit jump when they got that added and it started reporting. Stellarify is another one and that's where Meet Ava comes in at. Meet Ava actually does report as a $2,500 credit line, which is the largest out of the group. We did a dedicated video on that as well because somebody recently got that added to their profile. So those are options you've got there. Lots to do there. And the rent thing, even though I don't have that listed in the seven here, um, you could get your rent or utilities added as well through your landlord. Um, there's a lot of different options there. Let me just show you that really quick. Utilities, we can go through Experian Boost or Ecredible. And then for rent trade lines for you to do yourself, you got Rent Reporters, Boom Pay, Rental Karma, Level Credit, Rock the Score, Credit My Rent, and Payment Report. And then there's a bunch of different options on the landlord side. So next is you could do a secured credit card. This is very simple. We dictate what our limit is going to be. We put up the money and secure that trade line with the amount of money that we want the not only the card limit to be, but also what it gets reported as. So a lot of these, I'd say 99% of them start at $500 and go up. A lot of them cap out at like 5,000, but I've seen some crazy ones. I've seen up to 30,000 on a secured credit card. It's really just whatever you want to do. So that'd be a great way to not only, you know, break into the door on that bank or institution and start to build a relationship there, uh, but also too, to get another trade line reporting. All right, next, unsecured credit cards. So again, we just got a thin credit profile. So there's a couple different routes that we could go to actually get unsecured credit cards if you don't want to mess with, with secured at all. The first one is fintechs. Now there's a lot of new fintechs on the consumer side that will allow you to either go through the entire process and see what your limit's gonna be, see if you get approved, see what the APR is gonna be before you accept the offer, which would then be a hard pull, if it's a hard pull at all, or some of them don't even have a hard pull at all. Like CrowdFit comes to mind, the Apple GM card, if we lock down our TransUnion, that's not a hard pull. If you come up here to soft pull offers, soft pull credit card offers, there's over 80 that you can check out right now to see if you pre-qualify. Now, again, that doesn't guarantee that you're gonna get approved, but you could get a great idea if you're going to actually get approved or not. Now, it becomes even stronger if we start to match it up with, let's check out the uh, recommendation engines in like our Experian account and Credit Karma and, you know, your NAV account in these different accounts. Now we're starting to see that like we have high odds of this card over here. We're pre-qualifying for it. We got high odds over here. Maybe we're starting to get mailers for it, right? You start to see that we can put together a really great idea and plan to actually pull the trigger and execute on those cards. So, I would stick to that idea and that concept on the unsecured side, just to, again, uh, make sure I have the highest possible odds of getting these cards, because again, I have a thin credit profile. Next one is relationship banking. So this is what I call it. All that is, is that we go in, we gotta have capital. We gotta have some cash flow to deploy. So we go in and we set up basic checking savings. Maybe we get into some money market accounts. Maybe we get into some IRA accounts. We move over an IRA, a 401k, something like that. Or we start to set up, you know, pledge loans with like with Navy Fed or something like that. And we essentially manufacture a transactional history with them. We can do that. What's funny is we can do this on a personal side. We can do this on a business side all day. And what we start to get out of that is because we have a thin profile, this is extremely valuable to use this. Now, if you've got over an 800, you got a thick credit profile already, a lot of this stuff is like kind of Mickey Mouse. It doesn't work for you. You don't need it. 
more importantly. But if you are falling into this thin credit profile category, then, you know, especially with Navy Fed, we've seen now how many videos have we documented on this channel, like probably over 20 now where people went in, did relationship banking, built a relationship with Navy Fed, got the bag, got a 20K card, you know, got 80K maxed out on, on their credit cards, et cetera, et cetera. Auto loans, home loans, all that, right? Speaking of auto loan and home loan, that's another thing that we could do. Cause again, our credit profile is just thin. So we could go get a mortgage or if you're already planning on this, I wouldn't suggest to go buy a house just to thicken up your credit profile, but a mortgage or an auto loan is going to show up as an installment loan, but it's going to prove a few things. First off, mortgage is like what, 100,000 or more. Auto loan is somewhere between 30 to let's say 100 because cars are getting more expensive now. So by having that on your credit profile, it will mess up your DTI, right? But it will prove that you're able to handle a larger debt load, right? As long as we now execute on that, it's starting to report, we're paying on time. Even though that's got short payment history, it will prove that you can handle a bigger debt load. And it will prove that like, for whatever reason, banks love to see what I essentially think is a normal human and all normal humans apparently have a mortgage, they have auto loans, they have some credit cards, some, uh, you know, installment loans or personal loans, things like that, right? So again, that just plays into that. And then lastly is run up limits and pay them down on existing cards. Now, what's interesting about this is there's some people to this day that swear this is how you get credit limit increases at banks like Discover on your Discover cards. I've even heard this talked about with Apple, getting the, your Apple limit run up to 30K, 50K limits is by doing this. What you're essentially gonna do is, I assume that your cards that you're using now, you're maybe allowing a couple hundred dollars at max to report, but you're probably using it and then paying it down. And you're not even probably using it that much because let's face it, you probably got like a thousand dollar limit here, maybe $2,000 there. This strategy is let's start opening up the usage on that. What we're gonna do is we're just simply going to use more of that. Let's say it's a $2,000 card, run it up, run it up to 2,000, pay it off before the statement, before it actually reports, because you don't wanna report a maxed out card. That'll drop your score like tremendously. But I'm just saying like use more bandwidth, more width of the card. That's gonna benefit you in a few different ways. Two that I can think of off the top of my head. First is that you're making yourself look better for automatic credit limit increases. But if you're gonna pull the trigger and ask for a credit limit increase, they wanna know that you're using the card, especially with a lot of these fintechs, you gotta be using the card for them to want to give you more. And then secondly, if you wanna get a second card with that institution, well, I'm already using this one and I'm clearly hitting the limits of this one. So it opens up that conversation of like, look, love this bank, you know, I wanna do more business, but I need a higher limit. So they're either gonna give me a higher limit on the existing card or give me a second card, give me another one, right? So that's why we would want to deploy a strategy like that. And then another one that I didn't even cover on this list, which would be a personal loan. We could branch that in with mortgage and auto loan, but again, that's gonna report as an installment loan. And that is just another tool that you could deploy to show that you can handle a larger debt load, it helps add the credit mix, which is 10% of your FICO score, et cetera, et cetera, right? But anyways, I just wanted to give you this quick list. So that's eight things that you could do right now. You're not lost. You're not out there on your own, right? There, there are options for you if you've got a thin credit profile. Now, if you're just trying to like stick it back to the man, you never really had credit before, you got credit and you're trying to like get back at them to a degree, um, credit card churning and manufactured spending, probably things you wanna avoid, lying on applications as well. So let's dive into the each one of these, right? So credit card churning is where you've just identified some cards that have great bonuses and some of them will give the bonus up front. Some of them after you've spent a certain amount of money, the whole goal is to get that bonus as fast as possible before you've got any sort of annual fee or anything else kind of comes home to roost. And then you close that account down and then basically the next year do the same thing over again. Well, here's the big issue is Chase and Amex uh, have some of the best rewards programs and they all use internal data points. So not only does Chase have five by 24, which I don't know how, what are you gonna try and then get that account removed off your credit report and get that wiped? All that history and transactions and, and whatnot. So you've got that working against you. And then Amex is, uh, they've got an internal score that they use against you. So they're gonna get you, I guess is my point eventually. And so it's like, you gotta really question why you're doing this. Was was like the th a couple thousand dollars that you might've gotten away with worth not being able to get any cards with them ever again? I would say no, but again, you got to answer that for yourself. So that's credit churning is just basically going through the rewards hustle, getting it all, closing the account, waiting till next year, doing the same thing all over again, right? Next is manufactured spending. Now, some people stumble on this and they don't realize what exactly they're doing. <laughs> so manu manufactured spending can, can operate in many different ways. I'll give you one that used to exist that people stumbled on that didn't realize what was happening until after the fact is... Apple used to allow you to get your refund back on any card. 
So if I go to Apple and I spend $30,000 buying, you know, who knows what, you, you know, computers, phones, et cetera, right? So we just did a cash advance without the 23% or whatever percent that they would charge on the credit card. We bought it on the credit card, still there, hasn't gone away, did not get returned to the credit card, got put on a checking account instead. Now the last one should be fairly obvious, but it is a common question. So should you lie on your application? Oh man, should, because it's stated income on like 99% of banks, right? When we're trying to get a credit card. If that puts you at risk for not getting the card or getting audited or something, do not do it. Like that should be obvious. Don't do it. Don't think you're being slick. You know, like I watched some YouTube videos and you know, I'm going to be slick over here. It's not worth it in the end because there could be variables that they're tapping into and using that you don't know. Maybe they're not giving you all the information. Maybe they're telling you it's super simple when it's not. Maybe the loophole just changed today and you saw the video yesterday. There could be a million things that go wrong in that. I would just say that you know, if your wages have changed for the year or like Corona was a bad year or something, then just explain that. And yes, pick your best year and then um, be ready to back that up if you need to with W-2s, with statements, bank statements, etc. Some sort of proof of income, right? Anyways, that's what I do with that. Um, again, remember a lot of this is stated with credit unions. They will almost always ask you for proof. It's like a large amount of time they will. There's again, a few that won't or maybe with the limit you got to prove for, they don't need it. You know, something less than $10,000, maybe they're not gonna care as much, I don't know. But just assume that with a credit union, they're gonna ask you for some sort of proof of income, statements or something, right? And uh, if you don't provide, or you can't provide, or it doesn't match up, mm, the underwriter's not gonna approve you because that is going across an underwriter's desk. There's a lot less automation at a credit union, especially if it's a smaller credit union. And so that's just something to think about. Now, the last thing I'll say, code uh, 41, there is a whole world out there that you probably don't know about, and it is called consumer credit protection, consumer law, consumer finance law, whatever you want to call it. And you could spend and you could dedicate a large amount of time reading through all of this and understanding it and realizing how it defines people and what it defines. And you're going to find some really interesting things. There are ways to get things removed or reclassified or hidden off of your file. And if you know how to do those things, well, then what we just talked about, like it's different for you. You know what I mean? That's why I said I started this off with saying education is key because the more you know, the more you can do. Um, and I would even argue the more you could get away with the A-Z-E-O, A-Z-E-O uh, or 1% utilization. So account zero except one, okay? Or 1% utilization and it doesn't really matter where that that is allocated, right? So just 1% utilization across the profile in the entire credit profile not on your mortgage and stuff like that. We're talking about revolving credit cards, yes? So the AZEO or all zero except one, you have a zero balance on all of your revolving accounts except one where you have uh, essentially 1% uh, utilization. 5% I think is the minimum. You know, some guys will argue 4%, like whatever, less than 5% on that one account and that's it. That is an old trick. That is something that's been talked about in the forums for a really long time. And then you've obviously got another one, which is like 1% utilization across the boards. Both lead to a 10 to 20 point jump. I want to cover two common questions that I actually still see getting asked across the uh, FICO forums and across the credit space all the time. And those are the following. Okay, so let's dive into the first one. Obviously, you guys can see, you know, I lay out my hand for you up front so you can see all the, uh, the pieces here. But let's, yes, painful or carry balance. Well... This, uh, depending on how long you've been in the game, this might actually be like really, really basic, right? But there is a ton of people coming into credit every single day. Education levels are at um, different points. And so I think it's great that um, we still have a ton of people that are coming to the um, corral, let's call it, of education, trying to figure out what to do. Because credit education is not taught in schools and it should be. If they're going to give you a weapon, they need to they need to teach you how to use it, right? When you get a firearm, you're taught how to use it, correct? So this is no different because if you use this improperly, it will destroy your life. So painful versus carrying a balance. Here's the details that you need to know. It really doesn't, that's not the proper question to ask. The proper question to ask is statement date versus due date and then playing around in that because if the goal is to avoid interest, then we need to make sure that we do this properly. So carrying a balance versus paying in full does not impact credit scores. It's reported balance that matters. So the amount that squeaks through that is actually reported to the credit bureaus. If a card's paid down to zero before the statement date, which is usually the same date the lender reports balance to the credit bureaus, they're treated as no activity. 
Having zero dollars or no activity on your credit report is seen as higher risk than carrying a 10, 20, 30 dollar balance, believe it or not. This will actually drop your score anywhere between two to 10 points for having zero activity. So, like I said, it's better to have one or two cards at least that you're um, putting a small balance on. And if you've got a larger amount of cards, then every three months, you can just set yourself a Google Calendar alert and go spend eight, 10, 20 bucks on that card, pay it down to make sure that every card is getting used so that we're avoiding this no activity cancel request, which we'll get into in just a second. Some banks will actually send you out a letter and just say, hey, basically, if you don't start using the card, we're gonna close the account. Some will just do it or they'll just chop limits. That's another thing you want to avoid because then you're going to start to get um, substantial changes to your utilization, depending on where you're sitting at, if they start chopping limits. In this video, I want to share with you probably the easiest way to start getting qualified offers at the banks. There's actually a lot of ways to do this. We could Add, uh, get added on as an AU with a family member, we could do all kinds of other things, right? I think this way is actually simpler. You ready for it? Get added on to anything at the bank. Here's what I need. And I've got plenty of examples. Get added on to any account at the bank. This could be an AU. This could be as simple as a safety deposit box. This could be uh, any you know checking or savings account. This could be any banking product. And so get added on to somebody's account for that and then obviously make sure that you're not opted out. That'd be the only other thing that you gotta check. Make sure that you're not frozen and opted out of offers and you will start getting mailed, targeted, directed offers to you. I've heard other stories similar to this, right? About getting added on to uh, savings products, opening up CDs, you know, getting added on to Navy Fed and somebody else's account that had a large amount of uh, credit already through Navy Fed. And then they go and next thing you know, they're getting a $20,000 card. So this happens, you know, all over the place. Chasing 800 credit score. What I wanna do in this video is give you all the details that you need and the patterns from high achievers or what are called FICO high achievers, which is a 785 or higher. Let's dive into it. The elusive 800 credit score, right? We've shot a lot of material and a lot of content on, hey, how do you build your, your um, credit score quick? If you have no credit, uh, maybe you're a brand new immigrant to the country, maybe you're rebuilding, maybe you have uh, no credit at all. What do you do, right? So there's a, a lot of different ideas out there. What we really need to do though, from that place is to get old positively reporting credit accounts reporting to our account. That's it, to our credit profile. So that's AUs, that's, you know, setting up secured cards. There's all kinds of different strategies that we could talk about. And those are broken down into videos on this channel in the rebuilding credit section. I think that's where they all are. So anyways, what I want to talk about today is this idea of the uh, FICO high achiever. And so the high achiever is something that FICO came out with. And so that is essentially just 785 or higher credit score. Now, what's interesting about this data is I'm going to be pulling data from I think like four different sources. So bear with me because it's a little bit all over the place, just because the updated information that we've got from FICO itself is from uh, 2019. I've also got some reference data from 2016, 2013, and then some stuff from 2022 that we've actually got on the WalletMonkey site. I don't know if you've seen this page before. It's not really a huge, hugely popular page just because I don't think people know where to find it, but we actually break down statistical data and a lot of these are actually I framed into the site so you can actually see you can hover over it and get data but yeah this this page isn't that popular and uh it's got a ton of really good stuff on it so I wanted to reference this as well so here we are let's go through this I've got uh, maybe a dozen bullet points right and I'll try and reference what year it came from as much as possible okay so right out of the gates is high income is usually associated with high credit score, right? But what I want to start with there is high net worth individuals. When you hear that, what are you thinking? What is the price in your head? The amount of, of money that person makes in your head right now, as I just said that, what is it for you? Because for somebody, it might be 70,000. For somebody, it might be 100,000. For somebody, it might be a million. Like to call somebody a high net worth individual or a high earner, like high achiever, all of this is just like a googly guck because <laughs> What you think it is and what I think it is is completely different. So it opens up right out of the gates room for misinterpretation and limiting beliefs to creep in and tell us like, well, that's not us. So I'll never get an 800 or that's not me. So I'll never get a higher credit score. Right. So stop that for a second. Bear with me. All right. Let me actually we got to jump down to this section here. OK, perfect FICO scores in America by income. And this is 2018 through, I think, 2022 data. 2018, a little over 38 percent of FICO scores were perfect. OK, never mind. I don't know when this data is, but you can see it's it's uh, actually iframed in from uh, from FICO itself. So here we go. 
Here is the highest of highest earners right here. They consider that 150K to 250K. So right out of the gates, you might have had a different idea, completely different idea. So just to, to ground this thing in reality now, in fact, that's what that is. And 20% of the population account for that. 21% of the population is $101,000 to 150K. Next, we've got 20.49% of the population is 76K to 100K. 76K is actually a really common income, especially when you combine it with your significant other. A lot of people hit over 100K. So you're, you're high earners, you're high income earners, uh, according to FICO. And then 18% uh, was 51K to 75K. A ton of people fit into that, by the way. And it's interesting because the dialogue that they give me in the, in the the way that they talk about themselves is like, oh, they're not really a high earner. They're, they're embarrassed to talk about how they make 50, 60 K a year. Understand that that's still a really great income to be making. And according to this, like you fit into a large demographic of the population. Okay. So anyways, let's get back on track now. So a high achiever is a 785 or higher. Next, some interesting data. So according to the 2013 data, uh, high achievers accounted for somewhere between 39% of the population, but you saw on the 2018 data, it was like 38%. So I don't know what it is here in 2023 somewhere around there, okay? As of 2019, 25% of Americans were 795 or higher. As of 2022, 21% of Americans were over an 800 credit score, okay? Just food for thought. FICO high achievers have an average of 11 revolving accounts. This is where the sauce starts to come out, right? This is where the goods start to come out because you need to start putting yourself into this way of thinking. If this is working for high achievers, high achiever meaning 785 and above, maybe we need to start adopting some of this. That's the whole point of this video, right? Maybe we need to start putting some of this to play in our own life. Because again, remember, this game is not fair. This game has rules. There's a system created around it. There's rules and variables. We understand the rules. We know how to fish. We win the game. That's it, right? No different than Monopoly. So FICO High Achievers have an average of 11 revolving accounts. FICO High Achievers have an average of five installment accounts. Didn't know that. FICO High Achievers have an average of six credit cards. Should be higher, right? Maybe that's older data. I'm not sure. Um, I actually couldn't place that data. Nonetheless, let's continue. The average age of credit card, this is a good one. The average age of credit card accounts or AAOA for a FICO High Achiever is 12 years old on average. And then the oldest is 27 years. Whereas if we go on the screen here, according to our 2019 data, what we've got here is we've got a difference of 12 years on average and 27 being the highest over here. And then on the left, somebody with a 730, excuse me, with a 635 credit score is a pro the average is approximately six years with the oldest being 12 years. So you see the difference between the two. This is the top 25% and the lower 25%. That's how they did this chart because it's different than this chart because look at this one. This is the one from 2013. So we've got a 650 versus an 800. So we basically got an improver versus a high achiever. And then they're calling an improver 730, uh, 635 which it's not an improver in comparison to the 2013 data. So another big one, balances on accounts, right? The average high achiever has just $4,000 across all their credit cards as a balance, which they usually have balances running on three to four cards at a time. Contrast that to somebody with a 635 and they have over $6,000 on their credit cards, which here's what's crazy. That's gotten a lot better because check this out. Somebody with a 650 back in 2013, the average was $25,000 on a credit card. That's crazy. And high achievers had 8,500. So now we look, you know, somewhat recent 2019, we have 6,000 versus 4,000. So the, the gap is starting to tighten up quite a bit. I would argue like a large amount. We're talking what, 18,000? That gap has changed right? Okay. Now let's talk about available credit. A FICO high achiever has 93% available credit and a improver has 15% available credit. So they have a lot more cards maxed out, right? And then lastly, let's touch on, on this one on the chart. And I got a few more on my, on my list here is 96% of high uh, achievers have on-time payments and only 7% on the, on the left. Somebody with a 635 pays all their bills on time. So only 7% of people with a 635 credit score on average pay their accounts. They have past dues, they got lates, they got all that, which lates I've talked about at, they can stay on your account for five to seven years. So we do not want that. We wanna get those off as soon as possible. Okay, so they have three to four accounts with balances reporting, averaging just $4,000, we covered that. High achievers also only use on average just 7% of their credit limit total across the boards. 70% of high achievers did not apply for new credit in the last 12 months. Interesting. And then this other one is kind of weird too. I'm not really sure where to place this data. FICO high achievers on average opened up new account two years and seven months ago. And of course we got the 96% of high achievers have no late payments on their history at all. I think the late payment one is one of the easiest ones that you could adopt right now. Um, some other ones that you could adopt is just playing the money game better and getting your um, balances down, getting your utilization down, right? So anyways, why I give you this is because again, rules, variables, right? This is a system. This is a game. Once we understand these things, we can start to adopt our strategy to win. You want to win, right? I want you to win. I hope you want you to win. 
So anyways, I hope that this data helps open up your eyes to this. We do have quite a bit more data outside of that about high income earners, low income earners, et cetera, on this page. I'll link it in the description below. Some of this is timed out, it looks like, just because my browser, Microsoft. But the biggest takeaway I want to give you out of this video is that if we start to mimic and we start to apply these different things that we're seeing high income earners, high achievers, whatever you want to call them, starting to do, and we apply that to ourselves, what do you think our results going to be? Better than we're getting? The same? or worse, I argue better. So what I decided to do was go and ask the community, if you could go back in time, knowing what you now know about credit, what one piece of advice would you give to someone who is just starting to build their credit? First off, we got autistic pretzel, and the number one thing is never sell yourself short by settling for subprime and substandard credit products, especially in the beginning of your credit journey when it's a bit harder to obtain better credit products. There are a lot of quality options out there, even for credit challenged people. Great piece of advice. Next, George Washington, arguably the greatest president to ever live. You control your credit, in exclamation mark. Not the banks, not the stores, not your employer. So stop blaming others for your financial problems and take control. Set a goal, make a commitment, write out a plan, then follow it until you achieve your goal. You know, lie in your bed at night knowing that you gave it everything that you possibly could. I love that mantra. I love that, uh, that angle, that perspective. Okay, next up is Crypt, or I call him Sky. Always make payments. I've run up my cards a couple times because it happened in my life. Uh, the reason why I have a strong credit score is because I made at least the minimum payment every single month. Great piece of advice. Next up is Wilson. Uh, he says that your credit card is just a debit card with rewards. Essentially it is. You only get the rewards if you have the money to pay your credit card swipe back as soon as you use it. If you don't have it in the bank to instantly pay back, then you're not allowed to swipe the credit card and get an IOU rewards. I like that. Next up, John. Late payments will kill you. I've been in a place where I couldn't even make the minimum payments. Don't just look the other way and go 30, 60, 90 days late. Call the banks, they will work with you. They'll get you on plans uh, that you can afford. Sometimes they will waive fees and interest. A rough patch will easily turn into 10 years of collections popping on and off your report, all while you can't even finance a car. Man, no truer words have been said. Next, Medwin. My number one thing would be to get your debt below 10% overall. Short, simple, sweet, I like it. Next is Alita. Never pay cash if you can help it. Swipe it and pay in full. I grew up as cash and debit only since it's how my parents lived. Again, great point. Next, Vanticore. You, yourself, must set out a roadmap of what you want, how you're going to accomplish it, and within what time frame. Also give yourself wiggle room, life happens, so put in place contingencies to cut yourself some slack aka a backup plan. If you're disciplined and can handle it, the question should not be how much credit cards should I have, rather how much credit cards I want for whatever benefits and leverage I need. We all have problems. I want more money with the problems it comes with, regardless if that means managing 50 plus cards. LOL, smiley face. Next, Reverend Group. Education, education, education. Educate yourselves on how credit works, the good, the bad, and then make actual educated decisions based on personal preferences and desires. And lastly, option sides. Patience, sketch out a roadmap. I've sat on my hands and it's paying off. Discipline is huge because 99% of credit decisions will be made by an algorithmic program of some sort. So here we are, 2023 app spree strategy. So. We call this the game day strategy, but literally no one else calls it that. So let's just call it apps free strategy. Number one is do your research in advance and know which banks that you want to uh, app for. This is a pretty basic one, but I don't think people plan enough in terms of what they want to do. Like what banks do we want to be with? What do we want to accomplish here? We've got a monetary dollar amount that we want to accomplish, and I'm sure we want to accomplish that in the least amount of cards, right? I, I don't know if you want to have 100 cards. I know I don't. So what banks can we, what banks do we want to do business with, right? That choice and that decision needs to be made before we move any further, right? Number two, have your credit uh, profile cleaned up and any charge-offs or any derogatories removed, at least give that one billing cycle to, to take effect. I would say two billing cycles because a lot of times it's delayed. Like for example, Amex and a couple other banks, they pull your score internally and it's a soft pull. They're pulling from months ago. They're pulling from two, three months ago. So if you're just waiting one billing cycle and then you go and try and get like your second card with Amex, you're gonna get denied because they're pulling from that older, um, usually lower in this case, if you had to do cleanup score, right? Number three, give yourself three to five hours on the day of. 
this is based off kind of the older strategy that we had. And the original strategy that we had was, you know, line all these up in tabs and fire them off all at once, which I have actually done that. And that's where that strategy came from. I don't know if other people do that. I, I assume so. I've seen other people in the community do it, but that's really the biggest thing that we're gonna focus on in this video and, and has changed or shifted, right? Have all reconsideration lines or recon numbers pulled up. And in front of you, we've got quite a few. We've got Cap, uh, Capital One, I was gonna say Captain America. <laughs> Bank of America, we've got uh, Chase backdoor, we got Synchrony backdoor. I mean, we've got just about every big bank. If you want to do a credit union, you literally just call the primary credit union number and they're going to um, move you into the department that you need. So credit unions are actually much easier than big banks because you don't have to go through the overseas relay first and then try and get somebody domestically on the phone. Uh, number five, make sure your address is up to date at the credit bureaus. I would actually change this and just say, make sure your credit profile is clean. And what I mean by that is, Let's say you got no derogatories, remove all old phone numbers, all old addresses. If you've got two, three different name variants um, on your profile, just call them up really quick. That's actually a quick fix and get all that removed. One, most up-to-date address, most up-to-date name, <laughs> and you know, and everything else that's on your actual profile itself, right? Make sure all that's up-to-date and all that's been updated um, with your banks and with everyone that needs it to be updated because it sounds silly. It sounds like it's nothing, but believe me when I say that um, that can actually hold you back. That can stop you with Truist and other institutions that do a sort of soft poll and they're looking for ID verification and those addresses need to match up, right? All right, six, uh, don't try and do more than five banks on your game day. It's too many. It won't get great results. I would agree. I know people that try to do 10, 15 in a day. It tends to not go that well. Have all your documents ready. Yeah, again, this was way more true in like 2021, 2020. Not so much anymore. A lot more banks work off of stated. If you already got a relationship, you can usually get in with stated. But if you're going for credit unions, if you're going for new institutions that you have no real history with, then you're going to want to have all your documents together. You know, usually it's W-2s, pay stubs, things like that, right? Eight is open up all the credit card sites in a browser. I would say don't do this. And instead, number nine is check out, uh, check out bank offers with the pre-qualification list. So you'll be seeing that right here. We have an entire page with over 30 pre-qualification links. This is what this means is that you can go to the bank website, see if you pre-qualify with a soft poll. So they will not pull your credit and it'll tell you if you can get a card with them or not. Now, the odds and likelihood of these turning into approvals vary greatly from institution to institution, but it's a great start. And if you combine that uh, with the recommendation engines from like Wallet Hub and Credit Karma, et cetera, et cetera, then you can actually start to get a really good idea of your approval odds. We got letters that are also coming in, right? So our odds start to go up incredibly as we get more of those data points. A complete guide on what to do the day of an app spree, meaning how do we take the pre-qualification tool and the master credit card lender list, all the other tools that we've got on the WalletMonkey IO site, put all that together and successfully execute on the day of and get those bags. Let's dive into it. All right, my friends. So we've got all these tools, right? And a common question that I get is, how do we put it all together? How do we do that? Okay, so let's let's talk through it. First things first, WalletMonkey.io is absolutely insane the amount of stuff that we give you for free that you've got access to with no games, no gimmicks, right? So come on over here. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pull up a page. We're gonna pull up a tab for the soft pull pre-qualifications, okay? So check this out. There's 85 on this page. We've covered that in a dedicated video, walk you through all of them. So essentially from here, all I gotta do is click on these links None of these are affiliate links. These are just tracking links to know how many people are actually clicking through. Click through, and then you're gonna put in your, you know, you're gonna go through the actual pre-qualification page, right? Which they ask for the last four of the social security. They ask for all your personal information, et cetera, et cetera. Before we do that though, we've got other things to do. We'll come back to this. Next, get another tab open and pull up the master credit card lender list. Now, if you're gonna go with credit unions, check this out. We've got a credit union page dedicated. If you wanna know what store cards are through Synchrony and which are through Community and which might be through Capital One, Web Bank, et cetera, et cetera, you're gonna go on that page. Okay, so we've got all kinds of information waiting for you, ready to go. Okay, so let's say we're sticking with just big banks because this is like everybody else outside of uh, credit unions. You know, Amex, Bank of America, uh, Chase, Capital One, et cetera, right? Look, look, check it out. We're just scrolling through. Look at all these banks. Now, we try and keep this up to date. We check it every like three, four months. So every quarter, data is being constantly updated. That being said, none of this is a guarantee. This is this is really just giving you another piece of the pie in edge, so to say, okay? Some of these are still like, yes, this is exactly how it is. It hasn't changed an inch, hasn't changed an ounce. Some of them, they have changed. Okay, so we're gonna go here. We're gonna get our plan together. Now, we've got a dedicated video on apps free strategy. You can choose to do bureau by bureau, or you can line up a bunch of tabs and try and fire them off all on the same day. That used to be the way that we did it. 
I no longer do that myself. I know that a lot of people still do, but what you would do is you'd come here first, get an idea of what bureau they pull. So I'm trying to get Chase, Bank of America, Discover. I'm trying to get all of them, right? Where do I start? Well, considering the one with the most strictest rules is Chase, that's where we would start. That'd be the first app that we would fire off, okay, before anything else. And then we'd kind of stack everybody else in outside of that. So we would make our list and get all of that together in terms of like, you know, the order in which we're going to fire these off. Or if we're going bureau by bureau, we're going to filter through this list here and just pull up all the ones that are Experian or TransUnion or Equifax. Make sense? So we're pulling data from here. If we look to the right column, we see data points. So this gives you an idea of, you know, credit score and other variables that we've got here. I, I know that this could be better. I would love to have interactive graphs and charts. This is what we're working towards. But at least if you got like, you're in the 650s, for example, Amex, Delta, Sky, Miles, Gold, look at this, 659, 645, 688, 644, all approved. Low limits, but at least you know, odds are higher, right? And so anyways, that's how you would use these data, uh, these data points on this page. Now, going back to the pre-qualification, how do we actually use this? Okay, we've now figured out what bureau we're gonna fire off, what banks that we wanna do, what do we do next? Well, there's two things that we wanna do. First things first, we need to go over to the bureau and make sure that we've got the proper email address, the phone number, the address, all the extra, you know, five, 10 different phone numbers, your old address is going back to the very first childhood home that you had, all that crap needs to get removed. We should only have one on the profile. If you want to do two on some of these things, phone numbers, it doesn't seem to matter, but addresses, it does. Just have one, the most up-to-date recent for all of it. So that way, everything I'm putting on the uh, application, even a pre-qual, is matching 100% to the bureau. Get that done first. Okay, next, we can go pre-qual, but I will pre-qual, I would suggest the pre-qual next to a couple different things. So we can go through and let's just open up one of these links, cap one, get pre-approved, right? And look, pretty standard stuff. We we pick which, which thing that we wanna do and then it starts walking us through the steps. So we make sure that we type in our name the same exact way, our address, our phone number. Okay, you get it. Next, what else can we do to confirm or improve our confidence in the likelihood of getting an approval here is with some of these like cap one, Citibank, Bank of America, Chase, even Amex, all of those are piped into these recommendation engines. Nav has a recommendation engine. Credit Karma has a recommendation engine. Wallet Hub, kind of crappier, but still has one. And Experian has a recommendation engine. That means when I go log into those accounts, which most of those allow you to have a free account, when I log in there, it gives me this odds or this likelihood of getting approved. If I'm seeing a high likelihood I'd say 88% uh, percent and above, because they usually work off a zero to 100% scale. If I'm seeing that on top of getting a yes on a pre-qualification, it starts to look better. But let's make it even better. What if I'm actually getting pre-qualified or targeted emails, targeted uh, letters in the mail? So these are all stacking up to make it higher likelihood that yes, I'm getting an approval on this, right? So as many of those that we can quickly figure out and get connected up, that's gonna give us a better idea of our likelihood of getting approved. Now, if you're not getting mailing offers, like in the physical mail, that means that you've opted out. You need to go to the second uh, tier bureaus and opt back in. We got a list for you. So if we come over here to wallamonkey.io, we go to tools, it's gonna be credit report and bank resources. Everything you need is there, okay? So we need to opt back in so we start getting direct mail offers. So we wanna do that well in advance before we even have our app spree day coming up. So after we've done that, we've now got all this confluence across the board that yes, the, the likelihood is high because we don't always have consistency with the, the pre-approval offers. For example, PenFed's pre-approval tool right now just came back up within the last month. It's horrible. Um, it's absolutely horrible. So we can't just rely on the pre-approval tool itself, right? And then so some of these like FNBO, I'll get pre-approved for a certain amount, but then what I get approved for is uh, lower or different, right? It can be higher, it can be lower. Same thing with community store cards, same thing with synchrony store cards. Based on the pre-approval, it's not really that accurate, right? It could be higher or lower what I actually end up getting. So that's how we use these tools. That's how they all fit together. We're figuring out where we're gonna execute. If, is it gonna be a bureau or are we just going after the whole thing? And then we come here, we double check that, make sure we understand who, what bank is pulling what bureau, get our list together. And then we come over here to the pre-qual, see if they've got any pre-quals, double check our spam mail to see if we've got any physical letters, double check our emails, make sure we've gotten any targeted offers check the recommendation engines, bang, put all that together, do the pre-qual, make our decision, pull the trigger. 86 soft pull credit card offers. Yes, that is 86 different creditors that offer a, a soft pull pre-qualification form of some sort on their website. This uh, page is on the wallamonkey.io website. It's completely free. You just come on over here to pre-qual offers 
and it's uh, this one right here. And then we have the same four personal loans, right? This site is, I think, really, really good. I'm biased because, of course, we made it. But um, I just don't see any other sites out there that actually gives the amount of detail that we give and, and data. So anyways, here we go. Let's dive into it. At the top, we got the heavy hitters. This is like actual real banks, real institutions. It's not like fintechs. It's not uh, crappy credit rebuilders or nothing like that, right? So Cap One, Bank of America offers one. Chase uh, didn't. They, I think, opened this back up in October. But for a long time, they had their pre-qualification tool uh, locked down. Now... That is back open. It doesn't mean that it's like super accurate or really that great. I've heard conflicting uh, info and like I even check it from time to time and it always says no offers for you, no offers for you. So if it's saying no offers for you, you would think, oh, that means that there's no offers. But then if you go into your back end, I'm getting offers. Then if I, you know, I look at my mailers, I'm getting offers. So it really, it really doesn't seem to be that accurate. And I'm hearing that across the boards that like people who are qualifying for cards and going and getting cards are not showing offers on a pre-qualification. So I, maybe they're still dialing that in. It was down for almost a year, I think. So give them some time on that. American Express, of course, nothing's really changed with their pre-qual process. Theirs is fairly easy, especially after you've already got an account established with them and one credit card, they will just do soft polls. So on your very first one getting in American Express though, they'll do Experian and usually TransUnion now, both, but at least one or the other. And then after that, you'll get soft polls and you can get up to 14 cards with American Express on personal and business. Insane. Discover. Nothing's really changed there. I think Discover is great. If you're rebuilding, great. If you're not, I mean, a 10, 15K Discover card is great, but getting in there and getting your first thousand dollar card is also great. They don't tend to bucket you as much as Cap One. Cap One starts off at a, you know, $300 card. And then if you pay everything on time for six months, they'll bump you up, blah, blah, blah. Like, why would you do that when, you know, we can go and get something actually good like a Discover and then it's not bucketed and they'll give us uh, credit limit increases. You can get up to two Discover cards and they'll do a credit limit increase once a year, I believe, is still the going right there. Citibank is another great, great bank to go with. I know that it's not as sexy and, you know, viral as a lot of these other banks, but, you know, Citibank, I don't know the max amount of cards you can get, but I know it's at least three because I know people with three cards across personal and business. So I think it's somewhere in the four or five range, I would guess. And they're a little bit different because if you're using the card and you're putting a lot of usage and then paying it down, using it, paying it down before statement dates, they will just automatically give you credit limit increases. Uh, Wells Fargo, this is another one that a lot of people swear by. It's like polarizing. You love Wells Fargo or you hate it. Okay. Uh, FNBO, I think for the most part, most people don't like FNBO, came on the scene and commenting on a lot of YouTubers' videos, uh, looking like they were very, very community driven, community friendly, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But then just about everybody who at the tail end of 2021, to mid, mid to tail end of 2021, was seeing dramatic rate um, limit cuts through 2022. And from what we've seen on the comments on our videos anyways, that really hasn't changed. So HSBC, uh, pre-qualification is currently off. So, okay, we're at 85, sorry, sorry. Uh, HSBC is like, I don't know, I think they're moving away from doing business in the US. They're more Asian driven, European driven, I think. Um, are they in Europe? Don't quote me on that. Asian driven, I know for a fact, like Hong Kong, etc. Okay, Truist, not much has changed there. Uh, you can still go and if you pre-qualify for all five cards, you'll get, you could get up to all five with the same limit. You might get a hard pull. You might not get a hard pull on any of it, but most people are getting two to three cards. And if your pre-qualification, if you're going through it and then trying to submit and it's giving you an error message, just go into the branch. And we're having 100% success rate on people going into the branch. And that's on the personal and business side as well. Uh, regions, that's geo-restricted to only 15 or so states. NASA, that's a credit union. Uh, U.S. Alliance, Federal Credit Union, Navy Fed, you have to be a member and it will, the pre-qualification piece is built in once, once you're logged in, right? Same thing with all these credit unions. Like we've got some listed here, but I think most credit unions will do a soft pull of some sort. And they're either going to do this automatically and give you offers in the back end, or you're going to have some sort of front end pre-qualification tool. So patelco has got one, Dover Financials, Dover Federal's actually got one as well, American Eagle Credit Union. And of course, we got the GM Marcus. Uh, credit card. So that maybe should have been in the fintech. No, no, okay, that makes sense on them on this side. So the GM Marcus and the Apple card right here are both by GM is Goldman Sachs. Gemini, they went through problems and there was a lot of online drama, but Gemini seems to be okay. They're very solvent, it seems, and they've got no issues with what happened with the FTX dramas. So I actually like that card a lot. The rewards, and then you can reinvest those. So you can pull that out into the exchange and trade. You can stake it. You can do a lot of stuff with that. So I still think Gemini, I hope long term, sticks around. They're one of the older ones uh, in terms of uh, crypto exchanges and they're not crazy out there with leverage. So that's what tells me that I, I think they'll be okay. Tomo Credit is a credit builder. So no hard pull on that at all. Next, credit building cards. 
just figured I'd put these in here. Um, Prosper, the personal loan uh, provider, actually has credit cards now, $500 to $3,000 limits. Mission Lane, uh, these are in order of like okayness, by the way. Prosper is probably the best. Mission Lane and Merrick would probably be tied at that point. I've heard okay things about them, and I have no clue about these two, Opfy and Avant. Credit One is meh. Unless you're going to do the Amex co-brand, the rest is garbage. Surge, Reflex, and Opportune. These actually all seem to be the same. I remember when these came out, um, and I was seeing them in the Experian backend, like to see your recommendations in, in your Experian account, and they all kind of like hit the same way. I believe I, was, I tracked down the same address or something for a couple of these, but they just look like utter junk. All right, let's wrap it up. Next, we've got store credit cards. Now, these are always changing, but these seem to be consistent. What I mean by that is like uh, sometimes you'll get Victoria's Secret, you'll get uh, Abercrombie & Fitch, you'll get like, you know, mainstream brands like that that'll every once in a while pop up a pre-qualification process or you can do the shopping cart trick on some of these sites still to this day. It's just not consistent, right? So we've got these broken down. Look to the right here. We've got, uh, this is what institution. So we've got Wells Fargo here at the top on these three. Then we got uh, the couple Capital One offers. The Walmart card, is, as funny as that might sound, is um, there's a lot of people who have that card and love it. If you shop at Walmart, it's not a bad card. I would just argue that like Capital One, it pulls all three. I don't know. It's it's tough to really qualify that. But in the credit building process, rebuilding process especially, it's not bad. It's not bad. Okay, next we got some uh, some vehicle options with uh, Cominity. We've got Lexus and uh, Toyota. The Ikea card, I've used that as in the past as a debt weapon for myself. Uh, I think I got a 5K card with them. It's really, really easy. So again, especially if you shop a lot at Ikea, might not be a bad option. I would just say Diversify. Don't get a ton of store cards. I see this all the time. So many people go out, they get four or five different store cards. That's insane. Um, it's insane because those inquiries are taking away from opportunities that you could get later on with Chase, with American Express, with these other bigger players, right? Especially Community Polls Experience, Synchrony Polls TransUnion. Fortiva, don't have much data on them and like Gardner White, Bob Mills Furniture. I don't know. I don't know anyone who's got those. If you've gotten those cards, comment below. Let us know some details. Next, we got the Synchrony. Synchrony is infamous for cutting your credit limits randomly for no reason. You could be in perfect order with them, not carrying a balance, paying on time, nothing reporting on statement dates, and they just slash you. I mean, we're talking disgusting slashes, like 35K card down to a $500 limit, you know, $8,000 card down to a $500 limit. Citibank, Wayfair, I think is the only one still that uses Citibank, which I wish they had more. I wish they had more. And then this is a Birch Lane and Wayfair are like the same brand, I guess. It's a Wayfair brand, so they're both through Citibank. And then Home Depot, those are great cards, by the way. If you're doing anything like a construction job or like a side hustle in any sort of way, try and build up and get get on the business side of Home Depot cards, the business accounts. They, the discounts are really, really worth it. What we're gonna talk about is getting that elusive $100,000 in credit. All jokes aside though, there's a reason why I did that is because I firmly believe even right now shooting this, having now we're I guess selling a program, offering it is I think it's really easy to get $100,000 in credit. I don't think that's the hard part. I think the hard part is actually figuring out what to do with that actually being able to then take that and grow it into something that is meaningful, right? Like um, if an 18 year old were to roll up on Ben Mala right now and say, hey, how do I get into the investment game? What's the first thing you think he's gonna tell him? First thing he's gonna tell him is go to the, build up your credit, go to the bank and get a bank loan. He's not hoping that these kids ruin their life. He's not hoping that they use it as a weapon and completely destroy themselves. He's hoping they use it as a tool to start to lever up. But the thing that he doesn't talk about and the thing that's missing and the thing that most people don't get is that it has nothing to do with the money. It has everything to do with what you do with it. The credit card game is not a fair game. Let's just be honest, right? Like there's there's a ton of questionability within, within this game, right? It's not meant to be fair, but it does have a set of rules. And once you learn those rules and once you leverage those rules, you win, you get what you want. This is literally a video game, the video game of life. And it is getting the, the resource that you need because money is a tool, it's a resource that you need to then start the game, to then start to really figure out what do I do, right? So what I thought would be cool now that we got that huge tangent out of the way, is uh, to go over the quick start guide. This is literally the quick start guide where we start everybody off inside the credit mastermind. But yeah, it breaks down to the three things that we wanna focus on. First, we wanna get our personal credit up to speed. We wanna get somewhere between, I don't know, 30 to $60,000 in personal credit. I don't even know if that much is necessary, but let's just say, for simplicity's sake, we do that because then if we're using 1%, that puts us at a couple thousand dollars spend that we're able to use every single month. If you were to carry a small balance in the hundreds, you're still below 10% utilization. That needs to occur. Then what we do is we put all of our focus into sole proprietor. So that's step two. 
And the reason why is because it's the easiest thing to do. I don't get it. It really doesn't make sense how it's all structured and how you can do that. We're basically going and getting credit under our name, but as presented as a business. So we're going to get larger limits. We're going to get it not reporting to our personal credit. And then once we start, most importantly, once we start using that, it's not going to drain our personal credit score. And I see this time and time again, people making this mistake. How many people did that? Raise a hand. How many people went out and then they went and got like maybe 40, 60K in personal credit and then maxed that out instead of going and getting the business credit? Being patient a little bit longer, going and getting the business credit. And then if you want to go max that out, again, they don't care about utilization. They care about when you make the payment and how you're making the payment. Then we build credit on the business side, but it's like a pseudo business. It's a sole proprietor. We're just looking for larger limits and actual capital that we can work with. Then we're going to get that capital off the card and then start to fund it into whatever crazy idea you've got, whatever entity or, um, you know, real estate flip, car washes, you know, vending machines, renting cars, whatever your gig is, right? That's when you would take that money and start to build that out. Just make sure it's under an entity, okay? LLC, S Corp, C Corp. If you want to know the difference, we have a video on LLC versus S Corp. It got like no views. It's an amazing video. You should go check it out. Getting unlimited credit funding. Now, this is something that you hear me talking about more and more recently. It's because we really need to continue to change the education level here. Remember, the credit system itself is just a system. It is essentially a game. It's got rules. It's got boundaries. It's got variables. And as soon as we figure out what those are, we can put those, we can utilize those in our advantage, take advantage of those things. Yes, take advantage of those things and better our lives, better our situations, get ourselves into position to get unlimited amounts of funding that we need so we can, you know, live our lives, start our businesses, help our family out, grow our, our pocket of wealth. And that is our duty. That is our job, especially as men in the family, right? So I wanted to cover this again in a slightly different way. Maybe this will hit you differently and this will get you to start thinking differently. But this was all sparked because a comment that was placed on a video that we did recently talking about 800 credit score in three months. Okay, here's what he said. And this guy's spot on, by the way. The most important phrase you said, unlimited funding. If more people actually knew this, I think that's a limiting belief to most. They think because they make 30 to 50K and have three to 5K value on credit cards at best, that credit is somehow limited. It's hard, it's difficult. No, you can work a nine to five and obtain 1 million in credit. I would say absolutely 100%. Now, again, let that sink in. I can work a nine to five job, make 30 to 50K a year and have access to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in credit. Because what if you mess up? What if you miss and you don't get a million dollars? You'd be happy with 500, 600, 900, right? This is possible for everybody watching this video. This is possible. This isn't hype. This isn't a gimmick. We just, we got to understand the game. That's what's changing here. The dynamic is changing. Up until this point, there's been very little information that they've allowed to kind of ooze out from the cracks on what it's like to actually master the credit game. Instead, it's been coveted and held by those that are in the know, those that are millionaires, billionaires. They have heirs and, and family been passed down, been passed down, been passed down. They know the game. They know that the name of the game is to put 90% of this into your business entity name, because then I can just bankrupt that. Or if there's problems with that, it all falls under the business. It doesn't fall under my name. Whereas what is 90% of the people out there doing right now that are your average Joes? They're putting 90% of the liability on their personal, which is then going to affect them whenever they're, if they're ever late, God forbid, which has now happened at record amounts because of COVID and things like that. So now we've got late payments showing up on our personal, which is destroying our personal credit, taking us out of the game, taking us out of the realm of being able to get access to business funding. I got another piece of data that I want to show you. So this is a recent poll that we ran and I was just curious, right? So I cannot see who voted for what. I don't have any more information about what you provided outside of the very generic answer that you gave. What is your highest credit card limit was the question. And look at the amount of people that responded with zero to $10,000 limits and 11,000 to $25,000 limits. It was 35% for zero to 10 and 40% for 11 to 25. Now I would argue a lot of those are not gonna cross over the $15,000 mark. That is ridiculous. Whereas when you're getting business credit, it usually starts 10,000 and above. So there's 35% of people right now on the channel that are not getting access to something that they could be getting access to, right? And now we don't have to do anything really that special. Like we don't have to get obscene amounts of skills. We don't have to grow another arm. We just have to get what? More education. Hey, you should subscribe. 60% of you are not subscribed yet, right there. Okay, bye.